Well, thank you everybody for joining us. I'm Father Chris Alar here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. And it's a real crummy weather today, cold, rainy, but we still have a good crowd here at the National Shrine as we continue the important and very important devotions of First Saturday. And this is what Our Lady asked us to do. And today we are going to do that. We're gonna lead you through everything so you don't have to worry, but we're gonna start with two related and very important Marian apparitions that we're gonna to talk to you today about. So we're going back to seminary, we're gonna teach you about what the Catholic Church teaches, especially regarding these approved apparitions. Let us start though with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you send the Holy Spirit down upon us, to open our minds and our hearts to receive the grace you wish to bestow, especially the grace of the gift of your mother as you gave her to us from the cross and told her to take us into our hearts and our homes. Let us do just that and follow her lead as the disciple of Christ. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So thank you again, everybody, for joining us. I don't know if you were able to see, but we have um, on our cell phones, if you're with us here at the Shrine, you can follow along because this is being um, live right now, being um, live streamed on our YouTube channel, Divine Mercy, and our Facebook page, Divine Mercy Official. So you may have seen the topic today is two important apparitions, Our Lady of Knock and Our Lady of Hope. So let's start with Our Lady of Knock. Now, what important thing did Mary say at knock? Anybody? <laughs> nothing. It's one of the only apparitions where there was nothing said. But how could it be one of the most important apparitions if nothing was said? That is what we're going to look at here today. Okay, so let's go to our next slide. Brother Mark, do this is Our Lady of Knock. Okay, now. Although not a word was spoken, all right, Our Lady, who all, who all appeared there, and everybody saw them, Our Lady, St. Joseph, St. John the Apostle, and the Lamb, all right, they appeared silently at Knock, this is in Ireland, with a critical message uniting heaven and earth. Well, Father, if they didn't say anything, what's the message? That's what we're going to talk about. All right. On the evening of August 21st, within the octave um, of the, you know, we have the Assumption on August 15th, and then we have the Coronation on the 22nd. This is within that octave. So on August 21st, 1879, it started with 15 people who saw a two-hour vision at the gable of St. John the Baptist Church. Now, what's a gable? I only remember when I was a kid, my mom used to like to show Anne of Green Gables. And I was like, what's a gable? A gable is kind of that slanted part of the roof, or as we say, Michigan, roof or roof. And you'll see in these pictures coming up exactly how that relates to where Mary and Joseph and St. John were. All right, so they were on this parish, St. John the Baptist Church in Knock, which is County Mayo in Ireland. Now, everybody who came saw it. This was not like Fatima or other apparitions where only the children saw her, right? This is not the case, or Medjugorje or others, where only the children saw Everybody who came saw. So this was an open apparition, if you will. People from five years old to 75 years old all saw the same thing. I find that unique because sinner and saint alike, old and young alike, all saw. Now let's look at the next slide because this slide, and if Brother Mark hold this while I describe it, captures this image perfectly. All right, I'm going to read it, and I describe it. We'll have Brother Mark hold it on the screen. All right, the figures were all robed in white, and they were raised a couple feet above the dry ground, 
Then in the gable, so look off to your right on that image, was an altar with a young lamb standing in front of a cross. All right, so you can see that on the image. Angels were also there. Now to the left, so let's keep that picture up, to the left were three figures. In the center is Mary, you can see that. She's the primary figure there, robed and mantled in white with a crown, but she was not veiled. She was not veiled. There was a rose where the crown touched her forehead. And we'll talk about the meaning of that in a minute. Her eyes were looking upward while her arms were outstretched in the Aran's position. What is the Aran's position? That is a position that normally like the priest prays during the Our Father. It's a prayerful position, all right? So her eyes were looking upward. Now to her right was St. Joseph. So let's maybe go back up to the picture. To her right is St. Joseph, who was slightly bowing her, his head towards Mary. All right, and to her left, as we said, was St. John the Apostle. Now look at how St. John the Apostle is dressed. He's robed as a mitered bishop. He's shown as a bishop. This gives credence to the Catholic Church hierarchy. Now he's looking forward, holding an open book in one hand, and pointing heavenward with the other. This picture beautifully captures that. Notice it's BBC on the bottom there. BBC, there is hope. So what we're gonna do right now is watch a quick, less than a two minute video on the summary of Knock, and then I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more. So this is just a real short video. So let's take a look at a real quick summary of Our Lady of Knock. It was the evening of August 21st, 1879, when the apparition of Our Lady of Nock appeared for the first time. Mary McLaughlin, the housekeeper of the parish priest in Nock, was walking past the church with her friend Mary Byrne. They saw the vision very clearly. It was the Blessed Virgin, along with St. Joseph and St. John. The Virgin was standing with her eyes towards heaven and was wearing white and a large crown. Mary Byrne ran and told others while Mary McLaughlin gazed at the apparition. Soon, a large crowd gathered. Patrick Hill, a witness of the apparition, described it saying, The figures were fully rounded, as if they had a body and life. One woman tried to embrace the Virgin's feet, but the figures seemed to always be just out of reach. Other people who were in the fields a distance from the town said there was a glowing light around the church. The vision lasted three hours and then faded. The next day, the villagers went to report the vision and a commission was set up to interview the witnesses. Some of the members of the commission ridiculed the visionaries and thought the vision to be a hoax. The ordinary people, however, were not as skeptical and the first pilgrimages began to come in 1880. Mary Byrne lived in Knock for the rest of her life. She was interviewed again in 1936, and her account did not vary from her first report in 1897. In 1971, the church approved the apparition as being quite probable, and in 1976, a new church, Our Lady Queen of Ireland, was erected. Pope John Paul II made a pilgrimage to the shrine in 1979 and established the church as a basilica. Okay, that was a quick summary of Our Lady of Knock. Now, let's get into understanding the message. All right, now, none of these figures spoke. Now, as I always say, what was the most important words of St. Joseph in the Bible? Nothing. That's, that's why my aunt used to say St. Joseph was the perfect man. He never talked. <laughs> she says, why can't I meet a man like that? So, St. Joseph never spoke here. Our Lady didn't speak here. St. John, the apostle, didn't speak here. So does that mean the message is not important? That there was no message? No. No. Verbally, there was no message. But biblically and liturgically, this message is critical. Now, why? It's about the need for contemplation. Times of silence. Just like the Bible, St. Joseph never spoke. I am convinced that the biggest form of prayer that we are not doing is the third and greatest form of prayer. What are the three forms of prayer the catechism teaches us? First is vocal prayer. Many of us are good at that. 
That's our Our Fathers, our Hail Marys, our Glory Bees, our sitting down telling Lord everything we need, telling God everything we want. We're pretty good at the vocal prayers. Now we get the second level, which is higher, is meditative prayer. And we don't do as good at that. Meditative prayer is what we're going to do here in a minute. When I, we pray the rosary, then we're going to meditate on the mysteries of the rosary because Our Lady asked for 15 minutes of meditation. That is where you just close your eyes and you, you visualize the, the, the mysteries of the rosary. That's a meditation. You're putting yourself in the scene. You're not talking. You're just being there. But the third and the highest and the greatest form of prayer, the catechism tells us, is silent contemplation prayer, where you don't say anything. You just go before the Lord and you be in his presence. It's kind of, I always equate it to visiting somebody in, in a coma or sick, sleeping at the hospital. When my mom fell down the stairs, I will never forget. I immediately flew home and my mom had brain damage and her whole face, I walked into the, to the, to the hospital room and I never saw anything more scary in my whole life, seeing my mom there. Her whole face was crushed and the bruises and the lips and her torn face. And it, it, it just, it, she was unconscious. She, she, she couldn't talk. She was not awake, but I didn't say anything to her. I was just there with her, just holding her hand. And somehow I knew she was there. Or, I'm sorry, somehow I knew she knew I was there. And... And I didn't say a word. I wasn't rattling off all these things. You know, mom, when you get better, we got to do this and this and this and this. And mom, you know what? You didn't do this for me when I was six. And, you know, I didn't do all that. We were just, I was just in her presence. That is contemplation. You go before God in front of the blessed sacrament. You don't say a word. You're just there. You just invite God to speak with you. That's when God talks to you. God doesn't, he whispers. He doesn't shout. And he can't talk above us doing always all the talking. We got to be quiet. We got to be silent so that he can talk to us. He whispers in the heart. You may not hear it audibly, but you will hear it in the heart. That's the message of this apparition. We're the only apparitions. In fact, we're the only apparitions I'm aware of in the history of the church that has this in this way. This is why knock is so important. I almost think, you know, knock didn't come from Mary knocking. It came from the town of, that means hill, which we're going to explain in a minute. It has to do with the hill, which is the Mount Calvary. It's the mass that unites heaven and earth. And so knock is the name of the city that was named after a hill. But I really feel that if you knock and you go into that chapel and you just come in as God's guest, you don't do the talking, you do the listening, you do the absorbing, you just sit there in his presence, he will fill you. That's the message here. All right, it's about the need for contemplation. Icons are a great way to do this. We have the icon of divine mercy. This is why we can gaze into eternity without saying a word. Remember, St. Therese used to take the image into the chapel. John Vianney used to take the image of Jesus into the chapel. They would just gaze upon it. They didn't do all the talking that one guy told John Vianney, John Vianney says, you have an incredible prayer life. How do you pray? And the guy told Father John Vianney, I don't say anything. I just look at Jesus and he looks back at me. That's the message here. What an incredible message that we don't even think about. It's always about what did she say? What did she do? Nothing but everything. Be in God's presence. So icons can do this. You know, um, that, that's a powerful way. Now, you know, we talk about lords. Lords is powerful because of its biblical message, all right, without saying a word, right? The rose is on our lady's feet that we have at lords. Who puts a rose on their toes? Well, go to Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful are the feet of the messenger of peace on the mountainside? How funny. Knock means hill on the little mountain. And so without saying a word, the message was there because she had the roses. Um, as for the rock, she was on the rock. St. Paul states in 1 Corinthians 10 that Christ is the rock. So Mary standing in that cleft of the rock is the new Eve. 
born from the pierced side of Christ. Now, the Fatima miracle in the same way does this. This consisted of a night of torrential rain, right? And the sun spinning, which nothing was said. It's raining. Then the sun comes out and the sun starts spinning. Colors that were reflected, immense crowd. And all of a sudden, everything else afterwards and the earth was dry. Now, nothing was said. But what's the meaning of that? Everything was in the meaning of what symbols and what happened without there being a word spoken. For instance, this brings to mind Noah, the flood, right? Torrential rains, torrential downpours. All of a sudden, out comes a rainbow. And that's why I think Satan has hijacked the rainbow. The rainbow now is a symbol of, a, of, of, of an act that is not Christ-like, is anti-biblical, anti-Catholic church teaching, and we're being persecuted for it. The symbol of the rainbow has been completely hijacked. But the real meaning of the rainbow is the covenant. It restored the earth. So the rains and the, and the symbol of what happens didn't have to have a word spoken. So God talks like this without saying a word. God will speak to you. You got to just listen. And he could do it without saying a word. Now, what about Guadalupe? Here our lady came clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. Again, just the sign, just the symbol, just the image. That's Revelation 12. Her mantle, flowered robe and her star-spangled mantle. This is Isaiah 65, 17. Talking about making a new heaven and a new earth. This is amazing. So let's, let's go into this Knox symbolism that's both biblical and liturgical. All right, the four figures, this is what's fascinating. Do you know that the four figures there, now what are the four figures at Knock again? Mary, Joseph, St. John the Baptist, uh, Bapti- excuse me, the evangelist, or St. John the Apostle, and the Lamb. Those are the four figures. Now let's talk about this for a minute. All four figures represent the four parts of the rosary. Almost perfectly. Well, Father, the rosary is not biblical. Oh my gosh, if I had a dollar for every time I got that comment, that the rosary, in fact, about eight months ago, you can find it on our YouTube channel, I did a talk called The Rosary. It is biblical. I mean, look at this. What is the rosary? The rosary is not a bunch of Hail Marys. The rosary importantly, is biblical. It's the mysteries. It's the meditation on the mysteries. All right? Now, the meditation on the mysteries, let's look at this. I mean, go right down the line. The ascension. Oh, biblical. That's not biblical. The rosary is biblical. Let's look at Let's start right with the, 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 the uh, um, uh, joyous mysteries. The annunciation, that's Luke 128. The visitation, that's Luke 141. The nativity, the birth of Jesus, that's Luke 2, 7 and Matthew 2, 1. What about the presentation in the temple? That's Luke 2, 22. What about finding of Jesus in the temple? That's Luke 2, 46. That covers, that covers the joyful mysteries. Now let's go into the luminous mysteries. The baptism of the Lord in the Jordan. That is Matthew 3, 16 and Mark 1, 9. What about the wedding feast at Cana? That's John chapter 2, verse 5. What about the proclamation of the kingdom and the call to conversion? That's Matthew 10, 7 and Luke 9, 2. What about the next mystery, the transfiguration? That's Luke 9, 29 and Mark 9, 3. What about the institution of the Eucharist? That's the entire sixth chapter of John and Luke 22, 19. All right, let's go on. Let's talk about the mysteries of the sorrowful, the sorrowful mysteries, all right? The agony in the garden, that's Luke 22, 44. What about the scourging of the pillar? That's John 19, 1 and Matthew 27, 26. What about the crowning of thorns? That's Matthew 27, 28 and Mark 15, 17. What about the fourth mystery, the carrying of the cross? That's John 19, 17. What about the fifth mystery? That's the crucifixion, Luke 23, 33 and Luke 23, 46. All right, what about the glorious mysteries? The first glorious mystery, the resurrection, that's Mark 16, 6, and Matthew 28, 6. What about the second glorious mystery? That's the ascension, Mark 16, 19, and Luke 24, 51. What about the third mystery, the descent of the Holy Spirit? That's Acts chapter 2, verse 4. What about the fourth? These are the only two people can argue are not in the Bible. Everyone, I just did, 
13 of the 15, no, I'm sorry, 18 of the 20 mysteries, all right? Four sets of mysteries, the luminous, the glorious, the joyful, and the, um, and the sorrowful, each have five decades. There's 20 mysteries. I just gave you 18 and read you the scripture passage where all 18 are. Now, the last two of the glorious, some will argue, are not in the, uh, in the Bible. Yes, they are actually the assumption. Read Judith 15, 9, and the coronation, Revelation 12, verse 1. Now, the rosary, every one of those is biblical. Let's talk about how these four figures represent the rosary. All right, St. Joseph, who does he represent? He represents the joyful mysteries because he lived during the infancy of Jesus and he was there. All right, what does St. John symbolize? St. John symbolizes the luminous mysteries that recall our Lord's ministry of preaching and healing. Now, I should say that's St. John the Baptist because that's the name of the church that Our Lady of Knock was at. So you have St. John the Baptist that's in this too. I can't forget him. He pointed people to the Lamb. The Lamb brings us to the sacrificial and sorrowful mysteries. So we have the sorrowful mysteries being Christ being sacrificed in the sorrowful mysteries. He is the Lamb. And what about Mary? She brings us the glorious mysteries because she was with the apostles in the upper room when the Holy Spirit came. She was assumed into heaven. She was coronated. This is amazing, the connection. All right? So, also, St. Joseph represents the laity. How does St. Joseph represent the laity? Because he was sanctifying labor, the worker, and the family life, the husband. St. John represents, this is now John the Apostle, the church hierarchy. He's wearing a martyr, a uh, martyr, I <laughs> think we will all be, a miter, a miter, evangelizing by word and sacrament. He's holding the book. Mary, she's our mother. She's mother church. Now, the lamb, this is the liturgical. So I just gave you all the biblical. Now let's look at the liturgical connection, the lamb. The whole theme of the lamb is presented here. Beginning with the patron of the parish, St. John the Baptist. John the Baptist pointed to the Lamb. We know this. The Lamb of God, there he is, who takes away the sins of the world. Each gospel has this. Up to the eternal vision of the Lamb in the book of Revelation, all people are dressed in white following the Lamb in heaven. St. John the Apostle, let's go back to him. He's in liturgical garb, as I said, as a bishop with a mitre. He has the open book, which is the scriptures, which we read in the liturgy. And his entire gospel of John chapter 6 is entirely Eucharistic. St. John devotes more than all others to the Eucharist. That's why he's at this apparition. This apparition is contemplative prayer and the Mass, the Eucharist. How? All right, we're going to start with Mary. Now, here's the important thing. And I want to get to this because this is important. Mary is portrayed as, and this is very important, as the main worshiper. Her, her, her meaning is extensive. Now, let's look at our next slide. John Paul II, in his encyclical, Ecclesiae de Eucharistia, all right, which you can see on there, on the, on the slide, means life of the, the Eucharist, the life of the church. All right, he wrote about Mary's relationship to the Eucharist. All right, he presents her as the ideal model with the church that we are called to imitate. There is a growing, okay, we need to grow as disciples. So this there, I, I think you could say there is a growth process where Mary develops each of you, each of us, right, to appreciate Christ's presence in this Eucharist, sacrifice and communion in each Mass. The Mass is a sacrifice and a meal, and then we share it together in communion, all right? It's all Christ-centered. John Paul II wrote this. Now, let's go to our next slide. 
This was extended to Pope Benedict XVI in his apostolic letter, again, on the Eucharist. Sacramentum Curitatis, the sacrament of love. All right, the sacrament of charity. All right, in which he presents the Eucharist as the mystery to be believed, to be celebrated, and to be lived, again, Christ-centered. Now, here's what's so important, and I think we miss this. They complement the three elements that John Paul gave us, which we must have in our faith. One, the presence of God in this Eucharist requires belief. Only 30% of Catholics believe in the real presence. I want to somehow believe that that's a media-altered statistic, that that's not a true statistic. I want to believe that in my heart, that they just want to make it sound like nobody believes. So that others will say, well, what's wrong with me? I, I believe I must be wrong because nobody else believes. I think, I think that could be an act of the devil trying to manipulate and lie. I, I don't know. But if it is true and I do see it, we got to focus on this. All right, so first is the presence, the real presence and belief. The next is sacrifice. We are so not willing to sacrifice anymore. Sacrifice is the key. This is everything. This is what the priesthood is about. The priesthood is not about being served or clericalism. It's about sacrifice. And we as Catholics are to follow that. And then we celebrate it. And then finally, sacrifice is celebrated. Communion is lived. Now, where do we have all that? Where do we have the real presence to believe the sacrifice to celebrate and communion together to be lived. The Mass. The Mass. Now, Mary, as mother of the church, she is responsible for forming us, our minds, our hearts, and our actions according to the Eucharist, the Paschal mystery of the altar. This is what John Paul II says in this document that her life was totally Eucharistic. So should ours. Therefore, she enables us to live a Eucharistic life. And this is what Pope Benedict said in Sacramentum Curitatis. Man, so this Mass, the Mass. In fact, do you know in our um, Catholic faith, there's a, a Mass of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of the Church. We, we celebrate that as Marians, right? It's a collection of Masses of the Blessed Virgin Mary as the model, right? The model of worship. And it expresses, quote, our duty to offer ourselves to a holy, as a holy victim, pleasing in God's eyes. She was a victim, her sorrow. So as the model of liturgical worship, that's Mary. She is the exemplar, all right, of devotion, which the church celebrates in these divine mysteries. Now, Nock has all this. Nock has all this. Do you know knock? We spell it like a knock. It's actually G, uh, C N O C in Gaelic. Knock. And I said it means hill. So guess what, everybody? Our Lady of Knock is Our Lady of the Hill. Now, why is that important? Because the Eucharistic theme of this apparition must get us to think of Calvary and the liturgy. At every Mass, you've heard me say this before. But it fits perfectly. I didn't know, I didn't think about the message of knock being so central to the talks I have done on the Mass. And I'm going to repeat it here. We often get challenged by non Catholics. Why do you keep re crucifying Christ? Why? Why do you keep re crucifying him? Do we keep re crucifying Christ? You've heard me say this. It sounds like it when you read the prayers because it's talking about the sacrifice. It's talking about Christ giving his life, right? But the prayers of the mass are not to Jesus. The prayers of the mass are the prayers of Christ's sacrifice offered to the Father. The whole meaning of the mass is in this mystery revealed without saying a word at knock. What we answer when somebody says, why do you keep re-crucifying Christ, is we don't. Well, that's not what it sounds like in the Mass. Okay. But we're not re-crucifying. You know why? We're there at Calvary. 
We're here at Calvary as Christ is being sacrificed. Now, you've heard me say this before, but again, it all ties together. I never brought knock into this. So I'm going to repeat what I said two years ago when we did our first live stream. And that is the meaning of the mass, but now I tie knock into it. See, why did Jesus die on the cross? You've heard me say this. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Oh, well, he loves us. Yes, but he loved us from heaven. To forgive our sins. Yes, but he's God. He could have forgiven our sins from heaven. To open the door to heaven, Father. Yes, but he's God. He could have opened the door from heaven because he's God. All those are true. But the big reason Christ died on the cross that we don't always think about is the penalty for sin is death. When you, when you sin or I sin, we deserve to die. Somebody has got to die. It's just not a matter of God saying, well, you know what? I thought about this. I'm going to let you off the hook. Uh-uh. Your sin, my sins, somebody has got to die. And it should be us. Because we committed the sin. We deserve to die. We should die. We would die. However, God the Father, in his infinite mercy for us, sent his son, and his son died in our place. Now, all we have to do is accept that, but many don't. So when you go to Mass, you are there at Calvary. That's why every Mass has to have a crucifix. We have our crucifix over my right shoulder. We are going to be getting a new altar cross here. We have the the cross above the altar, wherever you have a Catholic mass, you have a crucifix. Why? Because you are at Calvary. Remember, God is outside of time. There's no time for God. There's no past for God. There's no present future for God. There's only one eternal present moment. And you are there as Christ is being sacrificed for your sin, for my sin. But we're too busy. We're too busy to go to bed. I got a football game. I got a shopping to do. I got soccer practice. Okay, you got to get to mass because only then and there can you receive those graces that Christ gave to die on the cross for you. And it's at the mass. That is why Jesus says in the amnesis, the amnesis is, is the meaning in the Greek is not that we were doing something, do this in memory of me, meaning I'm going to remember it from the past. It means it makes it present now. Just like Christ is present before the Father with his wounds. It's all present now. Jesus told St. Faustina that your prayers help get me through the agony in the garden. How in the world is that possible? Faustina's prayers were exactly 1,900 years after exactly 1,900 years after Jesus' agony in the garden. Then how did Jesus say, your prayers help get me through the agony in the garden? Again, because God is outside of time. Everything is at a present moment for God. So we are at Calvary as God is, is, or Christ is sacrificing and paying our debt for sin. This is the whole meaning. This is the meaning of knock. And it doesn't have to say a word. You go to the liturgy, you have it all right here. This is what is fascinating. Because of the crown of Mary and the rose on her head, her mystical title is Queen of the Liturgy, both of heaven and earth, right? Now, the Mass unites us, the, the heaven and earth. In fact, Pope Benedict said, he made it clear that when you come to Mass, and you haven't read a great book lately, read Spirit of the Liturgy. In Spirit of the Liturgy, Pope Benedict tells us, at every Mass, heaven and earth are united. When you come into this church for Mass, he said, it's no longer just historical time on your wristwatch, but it's sacred time in the fact of eternity. So he said, when you come into this Mass and you are participating, now you could be present but not participating, you're missing a lot of grace. And he said, the roof of the church opens up and heaven and earth unite. The angels and the saints ascend and descend. And the roof of the church opens up and, and, and mass becomes heaven on earth. And your guardian angels, you've heard me say this, they come forward 
They come forward and they kneel or in the sanctuary. This is why the sanctuary, we, 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 we really need to have like a, the altar rail again. Because the sanctuary is heaven. The priest doesn't even deserve to be here. The only reason the priest is in here is because he is in persona Christi. He's in the person of Christ. He's not here because he's super holy. He's only here in, by virtue of his ordination. That he is about to do the sacrifice as the high priest to be able to give to you the sacrificial lamb. That's why the lamb was present at Nock. And your guardian angels, they come in and they kneel around the altar. And as you've heard me say, they're holding a vessel. And what's in the vessel of your guardian angel? Hopefully not nothing. But what's in that vessel is what you put into it. What do you put into that vessel? Do you put in your very being? Do you put in all your prayers, your hopes, your dreams, your desire to be united with God? Your trials, your tribulations, do you offer them up to God and surrender them in trust? Is that what we do? Or are we sitting there looking at our wristwatch, chewing on our gum, looking around at the people next to us? What are we doing when we are at Mass? And then, the priest, in the high point of the Mass, again, the concluding doxology, raises that patent. And what's on that patent? The body of Christ. Because as I've said before, we have all comes from God, all will return to God. So creation, the first great act of mercy, the first person of the Father created us, the first great act of mercy, creation, but we got broken. So in the second great act of mercy, God sent his son, the second person of the Trinity, to fix us, to redeem us. But now in the third and the final and the greatest act of mercy, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, takes us back to God the Father from where we came to now be fixed, repaired, better. You've always heard me say, and I will repeat this again, every time I see the $6 million man, my favorite, I was, I was a kid, I was enthralled with the $6 million man. I had no idea God was using that. And I remember sitting there and they would show this man near death, crushed, Remember Steve Austin, he was an astronaut. Fell, uh, uh, crashed to the ground, got crushed. He's near death, he's not gonna make it. Gentlemen, Steve Austin, astronaut, we have the technology to rebuild him, to make him better than before, stronger than before, faster than before. And then it would, it would show this whole new revitalization of Steve Austin, the astronaut, better than he was before. We are that man. We were broken near death. And all of a sudden, Christ redeems us. Now the Holy Spirit takes us back to God the Father from which we came in a better state. This is the mystery of the Mass. And when does that happen? In the concluding doxology, when the priest lifts the paten and the chalice. And he says, through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father. This is where we are being returned back to God the Father, perfected, redeemed. And that only happens if we accept the grace, and that grace only comes through this Mass. This is the meaning. This is everything. This is the message of Knock. Mary didn't have to say a word. All the symbolism is, is there, just simply by what is going on in that one image. Amazing to me. Wow. You know, this is, this is so powerful because the mass unites us. It unites heaven and earth. This is the unique school of spirituality that Our Lady brings to us. Using the words of Benedict XVI, we can pray, Mary, you, in, totally, in a totally unique way, lived communion with God and the sacrifice of your son on Calvary. Mary's bringing this to us. So she unites the two, Christ in heaven with Christ on earth. This is the meaning of the roses. That's the earthly from the ground of the earth. And the, the crown, that's the heavenly queen. And she unites them both. Where? In the mass. It is Mary that brings you into that pew. It is Mary that perfects you into being a disciple so that you can fully participate in what is going on here. Your redemption. This is the meaning. So we follow Mary's lead as the greatest disciple. And we finish by saying this, 
Let's go to our next slide. There is the picture. That's the picture of the, of the, of the church at Knock. Look at that. What I just described is in that picture. The Blessed Virgin Mary, she appeared to these villagers in Knock, together with St. Joseph and St. John the Apostle, united with the Irish people who have expressed their devotion wherever they go. They're like the Filipinos. The Filipinos are the modern-day Irish, spreading the, their message all over the world in the Polish. Wow. No, many priests in Ireland left their home to become evangelizers. They're the ones that brought us a perfection of the faith. They're the ones that brought a lot of the faith to the America. Now, we can't also forget the many Irish who immigrated here and the many lands that kept the faith alive. Now we need to pray for Ireland. We got to pray. Any of you watching from Ireland, God bless you. Don't lose your way. We here are not far away. We're a little better but we're losing our way. We need to turn to Our Lady of Knock. The virgin, he, she doesn't say a word, but her silence is a language. Indeed, it is the most expressive language that is ever given to us. The message from Knock is of great value. Silence. Silence. Now, this contemplation before the mystery of God is so important. That's what the Mass is. The silence is contemplation before the great mystery of love. Like being in awe when you meet somebody that you are enamored with. Or being in awe with your spouse when you see their sacrifice for you and your children. Being in awe of the one you love is one zillion times greater when it's the one who created us out of love. This finds no response other than total surrender of oneself with trust to the will of the merciful Father. Finally, it's the silence that Jesus asked for when he taught us. When you pray, go to your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father in secret. That's the start. you got to have an individual basis based on faith and prayer. But we need, yes, why we need that private prayer, private prayer as a foundation, we need to perfect it in the public prayer that we celebrate at Mass. Why? Because this Mass is the only perfect form of prayer. It is God offering God to God. God the Holy Spirit offering God the Son in sacrifice to God the Father. When the two or more are gathered in my name, there I am. Amazing. It is all Eucharistic. It is all Christ-centered. This is not about worshiping Mary. This is about Mary leading us to Jesus. Now, I did it again. I kept promising that I would do Pont Men France, Our Lady of Hope. I'm going to have to wait till next month because I ran out of time. But trust me, we're not going to let this one go. I canceled her last month. I had to cancel her today because we're running out of time. But come back next month, January 1st. What a great time to talk about Our Lady of Pont Men in France. Now, let us get to what's really important. The first Saturday devotions. So I am going to go down and vest. It'll take about three, four minutes. Brother Mark is going to shut this live stream down. And please, you at home, rejoin us. He's going to fire back up onto a new live stream that is going to be the devotion. We want to have the devotion sacred and reverent by themselves. So we're going to shut this one down, get back on with us, because in three minutes, join us as I lead you through the first Saturday devotions because that is something Our Lady said, and she made it resoundingly clear at Fatima. So God bless you, and stay with us for First Saturdays.